Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome to Found Flicks. On this ending explain, we'll be checking out Apostle, following a man who travels to a remote island to search for his missing sister after she is kidnapped by a murderous religious cult. The latest from Gareth Evans, the mastermind behind the Raid films and the excellent Safe Haven segment of VHS2, presents a generally different kind of style with Apostle, which also is in English unlike most of his films. It begins as a moody atmospheric mystery, before later developing into an increasingly intense and at times quite gory experience. Suffice to say, I enjoyed the movie quite a bit, though there are a few major lingering questions in the film, in particular about the ending. So let's dig into Apostle, breaking down the story, the major themes of the film, and explaining what happens in the end. We meet our Apostle Thomas already on the way to the mysterious island of Arisden by train, hearing in voiceover the letter from his sister that sent him on his journey. We see him being enlisted in a flashback, looking much more disheveled and haggard. And indeed, the associate of his father's thought he was long dead until they tracked him down. As his father is too old and broken to help, it has fallen on Thomas to help his beloved sister, who according to the letter is being being held for ransom by a blasphemous cult. The man informing Thomas to only pay the ransom once it's confirmed his sister is indeed alive, telling him to first blend in amongst the members. Arriving to a dock and small boat along with several others, each is clutching an invitation to the island, and he notices an odd mark on his own. Worried about what this means, he switches his with another man's in line under the guise of helping him, and after boarding the boat, see the man's luggage is suspiciously marked with a white X. Good thing he switched too, as when they arrive on the island, the man is quickly detained and held behind, obviously believing him to be Thomas, and thusly that he has their ransom money. Upon entering the village, the new citizens are logged, asked to tell of their devotion to the island's god that they all worship, devoting every drop of their blood for her, and given a receptacle, a glass jar. Later hearing people singing a hymn of some kind, Thomas meets Andrea, then heading to the local church where the leader of the group, the prophet Malcolm, fills us in on the ideals of the island, to create a paradise, with no war, no taxes, and everyone treated as equal. Well, that sure is a nice idea. Hopefully there's nothing suspect about how they're making it happen. He recounts when he and the two other brothers, Frank and Quinn, escaped England due to religious persecution, and found themselves on Arizona saying they heard the sweet song of the goddess beckoning them here and saved them all. Things aren't as hunky-dory as Malcolm leads his flock to believe, confronting the man they think is Thomas, torturing him and demanding he hand over the ransom. Though Malcolm does express displeasure about how brutally Quinn has injured him, but since he can't help, orders Quinn to slit his throat. That night, after a bell tolls, requiring everyone to return to their cabins, Thomas instead does some investigating of the village, peeking into one window, seeing a husband cutting his wife's arm, and blood letting into one of their receptacles. He next goes to Malcolm's house, watching him move a rug, exposing a door in the floor into which he descends. There bumping into the young girl Fionn, Quinn's daughter, seeing her boyfriend Jeremy watching from nearby. The two have a sexual relationship which is forbidden by the group if not married, and so they have to keep their love a secret, which will become a huge problem later. Where he's staying in the hallways outside of each room are lined with glass jars with blood inside obviously sacrifices for the island goddess. They were really literal about devoting every drop of blood for her. He pours some from someone else's into his own jar, and when going to open the door, cuts himself on the key, and the blood starts moving, being drawn into the cracks of the wood. Seeing a frightening, wild-eyed woman appear, hungrily gasping for the blood as it comes towards her. The next morning, Thomas wakes up, seeing that he has several scars on his back, most notably what appears to be a branding of a cross, which we learn the story behind later. The boy Jeremy shows up, telling him it's time to work and asked why he was out last night. Turning the same question on him, they agree to keep each other's respective nighttime activities a secret. Jeremy asking for help with some scavenging of a boat on the beach. Here, Thomas confronts him about his sister, showing him a picture, and Jeremy tries to leave in a hurry until Thomas pins him to the ground and he finally admits to knowing her. He fills him in that she was on a boat of theirs a month ago. His father, Frank, saying they had no choice but to take her, as their crops are failing. And knowing Jennifer's father was rich, they decided to kidnap her in order to get money to help the failing island. Beyond the crops, they are unable to produce any new livestock, as any born are mangled and unable to survive. Looks like something is crippling their so-called paradise into an unlivable, hostile environment. Turns out they've got even more problems, learning that someone was out after hours and gathering all of the new villagers to the church, where Malcolm sniffs out who doesn't belong by reciting a verse from their scripture, going down the line to each man and getting them to continue the words. Thomas gets worried as it gets closer to his turn, but when they come to the man next to him, he also doesn't know the scripture, silent for a moment before revealing a blade 
For king and country, he yells. Thomas holds him back, getting slashed across the chest. The guards attack him all at once, impaling him from every direction with spears. And later checking the markings on his blade, learn he was an assassin sent by the king. It seems people on the mainland don't approve of the group. Quinn and the others becoming increasingly concerned about the possibility of them sending ships to destroy them for good. Attacking the man works out for Thomas though, making him look good to Malcolm, assuring him his act of bravery won't go unrewarded. Even though his identity is still a secret to them, Malcolm ups the game to flush him out, retrieving his sister, bringing her to the streets, threatening him to make good on the ransom, or they'll both be taken to the heathen stand. We don't know what that is yet, but I don't like the sound of it. Thomas is freaking out over what to do, going for his bottle of drugs, furiously tossing it, and falling to the ground, clutching his head, but elects to not go outside. She isn't killed, at least, but is chained up and the local kids are messing with her, poking her with sticks and stuff, which is pretty terrible. We then start to see an undercurrent of discontent is brewing within Quinn, with how Malcolm is running things, complaining they don't have the resources for a big festival he wants to throw, but Malcolm reveals the real reason for the celebration, allowing them to search every room in the village to find the money, then deal with the both of them. We also see here Andrea isn't as cold-hearted as the others, bringing Jennifer some food. Quinn goes to stop her, but Malcolm holds him back, showing he has some compassion, which to Quinn is his weakness. That night, Thomas has some plans of his own for during the celebration, wanting to find out where that door in the floor at Malcolm's leads to, getting Jeremy to help him chisel his way into the bricks under the house. Meanwhile, Quinn and Malcolm search Thomas's room, and finding a map sticking out from his desk, know that he's the one they're looking for, on the map marking Malcolm's house, sending Frank in a hurry over there. Just as Thomas gets inside and Jeremy replaces the last brick, his father catches him under there, and not wanting harm to come to his son, sends him off before the other two arrive. Finding himself in tunnels underground, Thomas continues onward, passing over what looks like a moat of sorts, which in fact looks to be filled with blood and gory bits. A lovely blood river. Approaching the ladder up, Malcolm waits with a gun for him on the other side, but hearing his horse neigh clues Thomas in, instead heading back the way he came, noticing that Frank is behind him. Where else to go but the river, climbing in and disappearing as Frank rounds the corner. Thomas crawls through the river, and the same elderly woman from under the floorboards emerges from the water, shrieking and coming for him, sending him off in a hurry, making it out to the other side into another cave, grabbing a bone for protection and looking back in shock to the river like, what the hell was that? He flicks a lighter, searching the cave walls, seeing crude drawings of a white-skinned woman appearing to be worshipped, along with the word Exodus. In the barn that Thomas was initially heading to, Malcolm is inside, the room overgrown in gnarled dead branches. The same woman seen there, who here looks weaker and even more aged than her version seen outside, implying that there are two different versions of the goddess since it looks like this one can't even really go anywhere, entangled within the many branches. Malcolm is surprised and disappointed that she showed herself to Thomas, asserting that he won't worship you as I, and cuts his hand, the woman reaching hungrily for the blood. But Malcolm pauses, demanding that he will feed her only if she stops poisoning their crops. We see how the blood and this feeding is connected. As she drinks from Malcolm's blood, the previously dead wood starts to return to a green and lively state. Clearly, the villagers are giving up their own blood to feed to the goddess in an attempt to keep their island flourishing. But their offerings are not enough to make a substantial difference anymore, and she's already being brought in more food from her weird wicker mask creature assistant called the Grinder, dragging Jennifer's wrapped up body in, hearing her muffled screams coming from inside the bag. Well, at least she's alive. The next morning, Thomas awakens, discovered by Andrea, and here he reveals the source of his scars, as well as what led to his path to becoming a drug-addled drifter. He says like her, he once knelt before a deity, and was a man of God, who faithfully led his parish into the heart of Peking to bring them the word and love of God. But they in turn showed him the devil. Seeing a field on fire, Henry is pulled by two men, each of his arms bound by ropes, passing by them murdering the members of his parish. They pull him to his knees, and steadfast in his faith, Thomas tries to pray to God to help him, though they keep pulling his hands apart as another gets a hot cross, using it to brand Thomas's back. And as a result of this situation, he lost his faith and belief in the divine, now associating God only with pain and suffering, while Andrea tries to argue that he is about forgiveness. In town, Fion reveals to Jeremy that she is pregnant, Jeremy telling her Frank wants him to go to the mainland and stay there, wanting her to join him as his wife. Saying he has something to give her, he runs off, seen by Quinn, who kicks the door open, grabbing his daughter violently, with Quinn not wanting to believe that Jeremy has fathered a child with her. And it would be worrisome if everything can't grow correctly, including livestock. That means that also maybe her baby would be born all messed up as well. Quinn telling her she has no idea of the monstrosity that grows inside of her. To be born in twisted lumps, no mother could call her 
her own. And he won't stand for it any longer, pulling a knife out and going for her. He does indeed murder his own daughter, as we see, found by Jeremy when he returns, Quinn blaming her death on him and saying he had no choice. Jeremy rushes at him with a razor, giving us a nice taste of Evan's penchant for brutal action. Jeremy gets Quinn in the neck falling outside in the streets, calling out for help from the others, lying, saying Jeremy killed his girl. He tries to disagree, but it's too late. Guards chase after him, and Quinn commands for them to prepare the heathen stand. One tries to tell him only Malcolm can make such orders. But since he's not here, Quinn has asserted control away from him, just as he's been wanting to do. Hearing the alarm in the distance, Jeremy running for dear life from the guards makes it to them, telling them of his innocence, but is caught and taken back to be purified. The ritual is ready, including some guys with extreme tall black hoods. Those are seriously tall and giving us our first glimpse of the wondrous heathen stand. Jeremy's head is put into a vice, cranking it tight on his skull, causing blood to pour into his vision. Quinn proceeds to shave off the top of his hair, preparing it for the insertion of a big drill. No! He starts cranking, the drill digging into his skull, hearing bone crunching and pain yowls from Jeremy before his movement ceases for good. Quinn is handed a small object, the symbol of purity, placing it into the cavern in his hole he drilled into the boy's head. Cool, so he's purified now? Seems a bit extreme if you ask me. Malcolm and Frank show up, horrified to see what's happened, but Quinn has already turned the town on them, declaring Malcolm to be a false prophet. Quinn wants Malcolm to prove himself by killing Thomas, believing him to be here to destroy their way of life. Taking a razor, he gets to his throat and appears about to kill Thomas, but gets distracted when a gunshot rings out from Frank, saying it has to stop. She has to die. Thomas makes quick work of the guards, turning the poles on them in some very sweet moves for sure. Frank runs through the forest, Thomas not far behind, seeing the other version of the goddess walking through the woods. He makes it to the barn, stepping out moments later with a bullet hole in his gut, telling Thomas to burn it all down before getting shot again. The grinder stepping out, wielding a firearm. Seeing this, Thomas instead decides to enter underneath via the floorboards as Malcolm and Quinn find Frank dead. It's over, Malcolm says, but there's no turning back for Quinn. Shooting him in the shoulder, sending him crashing into the tunnels, leaving him to die. Inside, Thomas watches where it's apparently feeding time for the goddess, the grinder placing a funnel over her mouth and filling it with bits of gore. He looks over, seeing three hanging bodies there now. One is Jennifer, still alive amazingly, and gets her free. She's surprised to even see that her brother is alive, Thomas responding that he's only dead to their father. The grinder clocks him from behind with a hammer, blood pouring from the wound, knocking him unconscious, and guards taking Jennifer away. Well, that whole rest rescue thing sure went south quickly. He comes to on the ground, hooks attached to chains dug into his limbs. The grinder cranks some machinery, pulling the chains and Thomas up onto a table, which houses the terrible device that gives the creature his name. An actual grinder to mash bodies up into tiny bits for feeding. Getting dragged into it, his hand gets caught in, completely shredding several of his fingers in a very painful moment. He manages to get up and jam one of the chains into the grinder, pulling him up onto the table. Thomas kicks a weight that yet Yanks on the chain, killing the grinder. He then approaches the goddess, telling Thomas in a strange language how long she has been waiting for him. Getting to his knees, she places her fingers on the sides of his head, growth stemming out into it, causing him to convulse, and his eyes turn white and odd-looking, resembling that of the goddesses. While in town, Andrea and Jennifer have been taken prisoner by Quinn, who airs his grievances over having to watch these people worship Malcolm all these years, and that he's the one that deserves the praise for imprisoning the goddess and discovering what she could do for them in the first place. Flashing back to when they first arrived on the island and encountered her, we actually see how wrong they have gotten things from the very beginning. Quinn sees the same cave paintings on the wall, but the problem is they misunderstood the message of these drawings. They are clearly worshiping the goddess, and that is what they are supposed to do, rather than feeding her blood, as we then see them killing a rabbit and forcing her to drink its blood. What they're doing is a perversion of what the rituals are, and doing them in a violent way, and this is what is causing their land to die and eventually becoming that her thirst is unquenchable in size, as this isn't how they were supposed to worship her. Instead, as Quinn says, using her more as a machine than a goddess. Thomas falls into the goddess's arms, a strange expression of giddiness on his face before sobbing, and she tells him to set her free. He grabs a lantern, tossing it on the dead growth, which quickly catches on fire, spreading from this point through the entire island, including the village, as all of the life here comes from her. And it appears her other self that wanders the woods has lended Thomas a hand him passing by a group of guards all impaled up in the trees. Back with the girls, Quinn is convinced that he can save the village, and he's got a horrific plan of how to make it happen, impregnating the girls over and over and feeding the babies to the goddess. That's pretty effed up, man. 
Ugh. About to leave, Thomas surprises him with a knife stab, leading to an incredibly intense showdown as the two fight on the floor. Jennifer gets his gun, but can't get a clean shot, and Andrea instead shoots their chains, pulling themselves free from the wall. Quinn pulls out a knife, stabbing Thomas over and over in the side. Yee! And the girls wrap their chains around his neck, strangling him as they pull him along the floor. And as they pull, Thomas hangs onto the knife in his body, disemboweling him in the process. My goodness! The entire town is abandoned in the island, the trio making their way to the final boat as Thomas starts to severely lose blood from his wounds, having an emotional final goodbye with his sister before sending them off. And though we saw the barn going up in flames, we don't know for sure that the goddess perished. Oh. She did. Thomas watches the boat sail away as Malcolm joins him. A drop of his blood falls to the earth, causing a little plant to grow in the ground. The two smile to each other as Thomas collapses. Roots enter into his face, his eyes strange and white again. In the end, Thomas was chosen by the goddess, knowing deep down in him to be a good faithful man, and transferred her abilities to him. Now he is connected to Aristin, and his blood can make the island grow as she did before. Essentially, he has become the new guardian of the island, and perhaps with a newly humbled Malcolm, they can work together to rebuild the island in a way that doesn't involve violence. This also speaks to the cyclical nature of so many things in the world, in particular nature. The goddess is obviously a stand-in for mother nature of a sort, and seeing this rebirth fits in with that. Also, Malcolm and his groups weren't the first to come here, and similarly the goddess will never truly be gone, only passed on to another in an eternal cycle, indicating the possibility that there will be more people coming to the island at some point in the future. At least Thomas was able to regain his faith, which, you know, makes sense since he's a god. Okay folks, that'll wrap it up for this ending explained on Apostle. While it certainly owes a lot of its foundation to the Wicker Man, it manages to take things into its own unique direction. And for me, Evans continues to impress, and it's cool to see his style evolving as a filmmaker. And don't forget you can send me video requests for movies or TV shows you'd like to see me explain by sending them my way on any of my social media accounts at Foundflix. What did you guys think of Apostle and its ending? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Foundflix. See you next time.